we remember it as a Bible story from Sunday school, the cute little ark in the shape of a bathtub, the giraffe's head sticking through the roof. But as we look into God's Word, the Bible, the facts reveal a much different picture. The epic journey of Noah and his family was not just a bedtime story, but a real event involving a real boat. Hi, I'm Mark Loy. Join me along with Ken Ham, Dr. John Whitcomb, and Tim Lovett as we explore a fascinating account of faith and courage. Noah's Ark, thinking outside the box. The key problem that people have with a global flood is the ark. One of my pet peeves is opening up children's books and looking at a picture of Noah's Ark looking like an overloaded bathtub with giraffes sticking out the chimney about to sink at any moment. Genesis 6.15 says it black and white, 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. As soon as you see those dimensions, 300 by 50 by 30, you should be realizing that that story is very authentic. Written in 1961, the book, The Genesis Flood, was a monumental turning point in how Christians viewed the story of Noah, the Ark, and the Flood. Henry Morris and John Whitcomb co-authored this work and established a scientifically viable explanation for the worldwide flood and the Ark that survived that global catastrophe. Although Dr. Morris went to be with his Creator and Lord in 2006, Dr. John Whitcomb continues to lecture and teach on this intriguing subject. He joins us to reminisce about Henry and their historical book. In the fall of 1953, a great hydrodynamic engineer, a creation scientist named Henry M. Morris came to our campus at Winona Lake, Indiana, gave a fantastic lecture on the Genesis flood. That really caught my attention. You mean the flood of Noah's day could have covered the whole world, have been the instrument under God of transforming trillions of creatures into fossilized forms of plants and animals, marine creatures. And we then decided to co-author our book, The Genesis Flood, which was published in 1961. We became deeply amazed and respectful of the Genesis record of the flood and Noah's Ark. Pulled from a dusty shelf in a small Christian bookstore, the Genesis Flood held a particular interest for a young science teacher in Australia. Ken Ham, the founder of Answers in Genesis, owes a debt of gratitude to Whitcomb and Morris for their groundbreaking work. Along with the godly influence of Ken's father Mervyn and God's infallible word, Ken was deeply impacted by the ideas of Whitcomb and Morris. In fact, they helped plant the seeds that would blossom into a worldwide creation ministry. There's no doubt the Genesis Flood is a historic book in this world. It's, 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 a, it's a book that goes down in the history of Christendom as the book that really started the modern creationist movement that is now spread around the world. And I believe the modern creationist movement, the modern biblical creationist movement, is really a ministry for this era of history. Whitcomb and Morris showed the world that the biblical ark was large enough to hold all the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. They also established that the biblical dimensions of the ark gave it the needed proportions to be a truly seaworthy craft. While the initial box shape was certainly a step in the right direction, Dr. Whitcomb admits that the box design could be improved upon. Henry Morris did the engineering part of our book. And he simply took the dimensions given, of course, 300 cubits long, four, maybe 450 feet approximately, the width, uh, 50 cubits, the height, 30 cubits, and just assume from those three dimensions given that you have a rectangular shape. Now, the refinements of that, of course, uh, God didn't record in the text, and so that is left to our uh, uh, evaluation analysis. Uh, as we think through the issues today. We need to distinguish between holding on to items that the Bible clearly references, clearly talks about, you know, statements the Bible clearly makes, which we adhere to and we don't change, but being prepared to be flexible in, in regard to man's models that are built upon the Bible. The ark in the shape of a box 
also gained popularity in 1976 when a documentary, In Search of Noah's Ark, was released. This film also presented the shape of the ark as box-like. But that conclusion came from unsubstantiated eyewitness accounts and a few blurred photographs of a structure on Mount Ararat. It's important to understand that there's no solid evidence to support the claim that Noah's Ark has been found and that it was indeed box-shaped. Uh, I personally don't believe we've ever really found it. That doesn't bother me, friend, because Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You don't have to find a piece of the Ark to believe that it was there. Some were buried deep in those mountains. And if and when someday God shows it to us, we'll say, Lord, we're amazed because the design of that gigantic thing that you put people into and air breathing and animals into is exactly what was needed for the catastrophism through which it passed to deliver alive our human ancestors from whom all of us have since descended. Noah and his wife, along with Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, departed the ark and entered a whole new world. Imagine the exciting stories they passed down to their children and the generations that followed. Distorted by repeated storytelling, these accounts found around the world have fallen into the category of ancient myths and legends. Although they're only shadows of the actual event, the bits of truth they do contain coincide dramatically with the real story. I remember one of the first times I went to the Brisbane Museum in the city of Brisbane in Australia, and I saw this interesting series of books about Aboriginal myths and legends concerning the Australian Aborigines, their Dreamtime legends that were handed down. And so I bought the books and I started to read them. And as I read them, I was amazed because I thought I was reading Genesis 1 to 11. I mean, it was a little different, but there was a story there about a global flood and a man who built a boat and three sons on the boat and so on, a rainbow at the end of the flood. And the reason that you see so many different legends and different cultures around the world, and even going back to the Babylonians, that sound just like Genesis 1 to 11, is because they have a basis in truth. The story of Noah's Ark, written before Genesis was written, by the Babylonians in the Gilgamesh epic, which has been discovered in cuneiform tablets, tells us that the ark was built in seven days by Utnapishtim and was a cube 180 cubits on each side. There's a contradiction when you claim that the Bible got its story. The source of the story for Noah's Ark comes from these other legends because these other legends have got lots of mistakes in them. They say silly things like, they're making a ship which is a cube and other mistakes which are quite obvious. The proportions in the Bible are very realistic. So realistic that, that um, those proportions happen to match a modern cargo ship. And we, we wouldn't expect that. If that was a made up story, we wouldn't expect them to accidentally come across 300 by 50 by 30 cubits as the proportions of this imaginary vessel. For example, when they make cargo ships, 50 by 30 would be just the this typical proportion you'd see in the cross section of a cargo ship gives you the, about the right stability, not too much, not too little. In fact, those proportions are so good that one of the naval architects that I've been working with, he actually realised that Genesis was literal because of those proportions in Genesis 6.15.